Inner Voice. A heartfelt chat with Dr. Fujian. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Inner Voice Podcast. It's so great to be with you. I'm Dr. Fujian Zain. I'm a psychotherapist, author, and the originator of the awareness integration theory. Our heartfelt chat is about what matters most in our life. Our mind, thoughts, feelings, actions, relationships, our fulfillment in this beautiful journey of life. Um, it's holidays, so what do we do is get a gift for ourselves and everyone around us. So for all of your beautiful souls that have been asking for our book, my book and uh, people who um, are my colleagues and together, we have created the Intentional Parenting, which is a practical guide to awareness integration theory. Uh, two of my amazing colleagues, Dr. Nicole Jafari and uh, Dr. Eileen Manukian, um, we wrote this book for you who are parents, grandparents, caretakers of children, uh, teachers, all of you who uh, deal with children from infancy all the way to young adults. Um, this goes through the awareness integration theory, step by step in every area of a child with cognitive um, uh, and uh, motor skills and emotional development, and then gives you all the issues that are uh, coming up with that specific um, age group and shares with you how to deal with that from the awareness integration group. So that is a great, great book for you as to give it the gift to yourself and whomever is around you who is going to deal with children. You can go to my website, fujanzain.com and get that book or Amazon. Now for all of you who are therapists and coaches, it gets what? This book, which is Awareness Integration Therapy, Clear the Past, Create a New Future and Live a Fulfilled Life, takes you through the journey of the six phases of awareness integration, all the principles, and shows you phase by phase how to work with your clients so that you can um, support them to create an amazing life for your, for themselves. And um, that, I think that would be exciting um, gift for yourself and again, your friends and family. In this episode, I am excited that I get to chat with Nancy Smith. She is a veteran divorce lawyer with over 30 years of litigation experience, who is now a leading advocate for collaborative divorce. Um, she is licensed to practice in Vermont and New York and offers nationwide consultation services. She teaches other lawyers about ethics, family law, custody, and collaborative divorce. She believes a good divorce is possible. It really is the correct legal, financial, and emotional support. Our first book, the one we're going to be talking about, Untangling Your Marriage, A Guide to Collaborative Divorce, uh, which was recently published by Roman and Littlefield, and it's available for you in um, Amazon. I really enjoyed the conversation we had. Um, she really talks about what the model looks like, why is that model set up, and uh, how it can support you in uh, working through that model. So if you've got to get a divorce, at least do it collaboratively, which has become the win-win for the family that you have. Um, because you know, if you have children together, guess what? You're gonna be family for life. So mine as well, do it in a way that works for everybody. Subscribe to my podcast, my YouTube channel, and connect with me through my website, foodonzane.com, and um, any of the social media. For some of you who love working um, on self-help, uh, this book, Life Reset, um, is for you. It takes you through uh, every single area of your life and uh, through the awareness integration path and shows you with journaling and how to work and answer these questions and go through the process that you can create an amazing life for yourself um, and, and uh, be fulfilled in that life. So... Um, you can also get that from my website. I think that um, you will see that um, coming closer to the holidays and coming to the new year, working on yourself is the best gift you can give yourself. So that should be a holiday gift just for you. Okay. I'd love to hear from you. So call me, 
uh, text me, email me, let me know what your needs are and how I can support you. And here it is. We're going to be talking to Nancy Smith. Hello, Nancy. So nice to have you with us, everyone. Nancy Smith, the author of Untangling Your Marriage, a guide to collaborative divorce. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with me. Thank you for having me. Divorce is one of those topics which everybody... Um, um, obviously 50%, sometimes 60%, as the statistic says, uh, we have already gone through it. But then it does not mean that because we've gone through one experience that it's all the same. It um, is so different. And uh, reading your book, it was so refreshing to see and and get how much of um, different angles you put in here. One is obviously the emotional turmoil that people go the differences between the length of marriage and whether somebody has a you know child in their marriage or not, or they're angry and they really want to go after someone's throat, or is it that they really want to do the collaborative divorce? So um, I love this about the book. Also, I loved what it what it had um, steps for people to to see that the divorce is a process not only legally it's a process but emotionally it's a process and what do you need to be able to go through that in a healthy manner um so those are all the things that i really got from you Brooke. um why did you want to write this book well thank you Kajan. it's when you say the word divorce everybody has an opinion about it right there's everyone's got an opinion and a lot of people 50 percent of married couples in the united states have been divorced 75% of second marriages end in divorce. So everyone's got a feeling about it. And in my experience, I didn't obviously grow up to be a divorce lawyer. That wasn't my original intention, but that's kind of what's happened um, with my practice. And I found that I really like being able to help people through a transition and to be able to come out the other side of a divorce process healthy and wholehearted instead of bitter and resentful. And so what I thought about about because I've been doing collaborative divorce in the model and we can talk about that but I've been doing that since about 2005 and when I had first heard about it it's been around for about 30 years and it just was a breath of fresh air to me it was just such a different approach to untangling people's long-term important relationships where you stood before your friends your family and the god of your understanding and pledged your love and devotion to one another and we can talk about like those vows and how they're maybe not so realistic in a modern world, but you did it. And then at the time of a divorce, you get to the divorce lawyer and you are so wounded and hurt and you act out and people just behave really terribly. And so I was very curious about why that is. And then just from my own experience and being able to work with other mental health professionals, I just really do see divorce now through the lens of grief and it explains a lot of the bad behavior, um, you know, that you would call problematic and that might want to lead somebody to a courtroom showdown with your spouse as if somehow that's going to assuage all of your intense emotions and sadness um, about it, which is really ultimately kind of what it is. Um, so there's, there's all of that. So that's, I wanted to write the book so that the public would understand that they had an option. And it's not for lawyers. It's not written with legalese. There's definite steps like you alluded to. There's a lot of practicality about it. And it's really kind of a guide, a companion. If you're thinking about a divorce, if you're going through the divorce, how can I show up for this experience of my life that is probably bringing me to my knees in a way that no other adult experience has happened before? But how can I still show up with my integrity and some dignity and how can I treat my spouse um, with some empathy and compassion like I would want back at, you know, for myself, like, and how can I treat myself with some empathy and compassion and how do I want to show up and grow up and be the person that I think I am during this very challenging moment in time. And so I think the book is designed 
for that kind of reader. Uh, one of the things I usually say is imagine the same concept that you have with employment. You know, like when you're working somewhere and then you figure, you know, I, I would like to uh, resign and I would like to go to another place. And then, you know, when you go to a new place, the, the place usually asks for references. <laughs> you have to take a recommendation letter or they want a phone number so they can call your past employee. Imagine if that was the case uh, for intimate relationships and that, you know, when you were leaving a relationship, um, you needed to see that, um, you know, you needed to have a reference for the next relationship. How would you uh, how would you complete uh, this relationship in a sense? And would you go into a you know complete war and revenge and you know all of that, or would you treat it in a different way? And then for people who have children, you know, I usually share with uh, with the couple that your relationship will change from a married couple to family because you will always now be family. There's no way that you will no longer be family. So it's like treat each other in a way that you could handle going to your children's, I don't know, graduation, you know, um, weddings and, you know, events and all of that. And not to be in a space of continuous rage and, uh, and revenge. And it takes a lot of emotional completion to be able to get to that place and then, you know, go into a negotiation. I know that the negotiation for the divorce is a place that, you know, when, when people are married, supposedly, not all the time, but supposedly they're thinking about a win-win situation for both and us. When you go walk into a divorce, it's there is no longer an us. So obviously each person is going to think about, this is my last chance to um, think about me and, you know, do the contract in a way that is the best for me. So in that realm, obviously, there's going to be um, a lot of maybe disagreements and back and forthness in this negotiation. But like any other negotiation, we can negotiate an all or nothing best for me, screw you. Or we can negotiate that if you're going to be my family for the rest of my life, um, you know, let's negotiate that for something that we both can and can be good about it. Mm -hmm. um, so share a little bit about how to go from this context of all or nothing. I have to win everything. Screw you <laughs> rather than, you know, win win situation. Right. So I love that idea of the emotional completion. Um, and you can't really come to the negotiation for the final details about important, the most important things in your life, your relationship with your children and your future financial security. I would suggest you cannot come to that negotiation until you have done the emotional work where you feel safe, where you feel like you are not going to be screwed over, where you feel like you understand the financial reality that you understand that you may have to make some sacrifices. If you want to still be involved in your children's life, but you've been the historic wage earner and you're out of the house all the time, you may need to take a look at your career and say, well, maybe I need to, you know, slow it down a little bit or, or take a step back or figure out a way how I can uh, renegotiate my life, what whatever my priorities are. And I think in a collaborative model, which is an interdisciplinary model, it's designed to manage uh, the legal aspects, the emotional aspects and the financial aspects. And so what I like to say is divorce is 80% emotional, 10% legal, 10% financial. And if you take your it, the first few months of your divorce process and you work on your emotional maturity and your closure issues and recognizing that when somebody says they want a divorce, it is a gut punch. It is like one of the most sort of, if you're on the receiving end of it, it's really hard. If you're the one asking for it, it's really hard. Um, there's a lot of stigma, a lot of shame still about it. And um, no one feels great about it. But if you at least did your research ahead of time and even read the book, you would know how to talk to your spouse about it and say, look, I know this is going to be a shock. However, I think we could do it in a way that we both could emerge healthy and wholehearted, not bitter and resentful, but it's going to require work. And it's going to require that we both take some responsibility for our contribution to how the marriage is ending and how we want to engage in this process. And that's where I think people have a lot of power that they don't realize that they have, that they can choose a process that's going to align with their values 
even when they're feeling really wounded and rejected. And I never want to underestimate the emotional impact of rejection on the human spirit. It's huge. And behaviors come out that you just didn't even know that you had because you are so, um, the feeling rejected brings up all of your early childhood stuff about abandonment and attachment issues. And if you don't have a sense of where all this anger is coming from, you need to go into therapy right now. Like even take a, take a pause and let your spouse catch up. Even if you are the one who's asked for it, you can say, look, I might be ready. I've been in therapy for a year and I realize I don't want to be in this marriage anymore. That's good for you. But if your spouse hasn't got that emotional closure yet and clarity to realize that this is actually going to be a benefit and having two homes, two families, you know, having a family in two homes, uh, that's how we kind of start it. And if you can be the one who can say, look, I, I understand that this might be a shock to you. Uh, however, we can have support. We can have a, a team. We can have the mental health coach normalizing our intense emotions. We can have the financial neutral gathering and collecting all of the financial information so that we can both make good decisions. And if you're the one who hasn't been the historic wage earner or manager of the money, you're going to feel really insecure and at a disadvantage. And so in a collaborative model, we're just leveling the playing field. Um, and I think clients should know that collaborative divorce exists. And I think right now it's a bit of a best kept, you know, divorce lawyer secret at the moment. But I think <laughs> more people are getting more people are understanding that it exists. Some of the work uh, that I've done with couples, I always say, you know, what you're either going to get complete within the marriage and another person is going to get complete outside the marriage because the person who's usually asking for the divorce have already gone through their grief and bargaining stages and all of that through the marriage as they're coming to a place of finally saying, this is it, I want a divorce. Usually by the time one person says that, the other person gets shocked because they're still in the... Um, you know, in the bargaining stages, but what if this and what if that, and you just said it beautifully, then it feels the rejection and the rejection goes. Um, so, you know, you're either going to go through this process and complete your grief. Um, and the grief isn't about just what you had, but, you know, we all have a vision of until death do us apart. So this concept of also the grief of the future that we've, we, we've created for ourselves. And to go through that process while you're also trying to figure out who am I without this, especially for the long range of uh, the marriages, who am I? Because I built my identity with this person. You know, I don't even know who I am afterward or for many people who are dependent together as far as finances and they have no idea. They, you know, someone who hasn't had a career for 20 years and suddenly they have to not only be a single person like a single mother or a father, and now they have to now be a career person. Um, and, you know, it, it's a overwhelming. It's a very high anxiety. And um, so it's it's all of these emotional processes that they have to go through. And uh, it's important for them to know what these processes, there have been attorneys who have called me and said, come in and, um, you know, let's do this together because, they couldn't do their work because there was so much emotions that that were coming that they're like, I'm not equipped for this. I cannot work with this. And I want to keep taking them to the, you know, the financial agreement, but it, you know, we have an hour of, uh, you did this and you did this and your mother did this and your sister did this. <laughs> and, you know, how dare you, you had an affair. And it's like, you know, it's the conversations show up in the attorney's room. It's like, I'm not even equipped to, to handle any of these things. So um, it is so important to be able to go through these conversations in a place where someone is equipped to handle that. Like you said, you know, a therapist, a um, marriage therapist, a divorce therapist, a mental health coach, for the person to come to some terms with the actual concept of separation and divorce, and then go through the the, the financial and legal processes. One of the um, concepts that I saw in your book, which I really loved, which is the in one of the appendixes, is like how it works for the client. And you wrote, you know, the stuff of commitment and then hope and concerns and then gather and organize information and then generate and evaluate um, choices that are available and then reach an agreement. Can you share a little bit about that process? Sure. So that is 
actually the collaborative model in a nutshell. It's um, it's that hopeful process where a couple can come in and say, we can ask them, you know, what do you hope will be better by going through a non-adversarial out of court settlement process where you're going to get your needs met, where you're going to be heard, and where all of the professionals who are on the team, this interdisciplinary team, understand the grief that you're going through going through. And even I, what we find is even at the very first meeting, even if you've been the one who's been thinking about it, to your point about the grief being super complex and layered, right? It's not just losing your status as a spouse. You, To your point about identity, that's a huge issue. People are losing their identity if they've been a primary homemaker for years. Um, you lose your best friend, you lose your lover, you lose Someone's going to lose their home, their housing. Some, maybe both of you might be getting, you know, you might be downsizing. Um, you're going to lose like where your sense of security and where you're going for the holidays. Like that's a huge issue. You lose um, half of your family wealth that you've been generating, whether you, you know, pretty much that's going to be close to what is going to happen. You're going to be um, losing who, yeah, you, who you think you are and who you thought you were. And then I think the thing that really gets people the most is like that loss of the dream of what you thought you were creating. And that's the one that gets you right in the heart. It's like, that's the one people struggle with. So even if you've been the one who, who maybe is initiating the divorce and wants to get it going, by the time you actually show up in, in, in a collaborative model and we're having our first meeting and we're talking about goals, it's a very emotional meeting because it's real now. Like before it was a fantasy, you were thinking, oh, how, much, how great my life is going to be and somehow I'm going to get over the divorce. But you've got to go through these these experiences and the, and the emotions of it and the grief. And so some, and because grief is not sick, it's not, you know, uh, sick, it's cyclical, right? It comes and goes and like you're at, at different stages at different times and both of you are going to have to be going through it. So before you can even show up um, to have these conversations, we're, we're, we're talking about it. The lawyers are each talking about it. Collaboratively trained attorneys are a different breed of family lawyer than traditional adversarial lawyers. We have had a paradigm shift. That's what we call it. Um, there's the International Academy of Collaborative Professionals that lays out the training and the best practices. And we've all taken it really very seriously and we've been doing it for like 30 years. So what you described is that process, the funnel of how to get the how to get to the end where you're generating options that are good for you and good for me and good for the family as a system, that takes a lot of time and planning. And depending on where the clients are, because we meet and take our clients as we find them, if they are emotionally ready, if they've been separated for a year, have been through therapy, been through couples therapy, did discernment counseling, like really have a good handle on the fact that they love each other, but they just cannot stay married anymore. And they will be good co-parents and, and friendly. Um, if they've already got that, then it won't take that long to get to generating the options because at the same time that they're processing the emotions and having conversations about kids if they have them and whether the children are minors or adults, like adult children have their own specific reactions and feelings about their parents' divorces. And so we don't want to underestimate uh, the impact on adult children of the divorce emotional process either. And so we just take all that into consideration. And then we start at the same time that we're dealing with the emotional stuff. The financial neutral is gathering all the financial data and then presenting it to all of us. And then the lawyers are, are we sort of take a back role until you need us um, because we recognize that the lawyers are usually the most expensive um, of the team members. And so we want the clients to be working with the professional that they need. So if they need emotional support, communication support, building trust again, if there's been an affair, you know, rebuilding trust and accountability are huge factors that need to happen, but that takes time. And you got to sometimes slow the process down a little bit. You work with the mental health coach on that stuff. At the same time, the financial neutral is gathering financial data. And when people are psychologically ready and the team assesses that, the professional team really respect each other. And we have occasional meetings with each other to make sure that the clients are doing all right. And um, and if something comes up, we address it. We come together when we need to. And then we generate options that are win-win. So to that point of in a traditional negotiation, often we would send out an offer that is a low ball. <laughs> and it's pretty insulting, frankly. And we don't do that in a collaborative model. We we check ourselves before the lawyers even make suggestions that might be reasonable. We want to make sure that it's good for my client and it's good for your client. And if I would, if I would, 
I'm not going to put out something that's going to insult you because we've spent, you know, six months or so building relationships. We don't want to start insulting people at the very end. One of the things that you just said uh, reminded me that there is this myth that the person who's asking for the divorce uh, has got it easy. It's the one who is, you know, kind of like you, you go into like a villain victim position, not knowing that the person who's also going through the divorce has another layer, which is guilt. You know, the concept of I will always be the guilty one is like you asked for the divorce when, you know, the kids come back is like the kids will always put it in your face that you asked for the divorce. And then you have to come up with defensive uh, attack, a defensive attack, which is, well, I did it because, you know, the other one was bad enough. So I had to do it. And, you know, you go through this process of, of um, victim villainhood, uh, which the villain is also supposed to be the victim. And, um, and then getting people off of that victimhood and looking at what was my responsibility that I'm part of creating this result. And, um, you know, whatever, whatever is in front of me, I also had something to do with it. We both had something to do with it. And then coming to terms with that responsibility and that helps a little bit of completing those emotional processes, which then leads to um, collaborative divorce. Um, another thing that I've noticed always is that people who um, talk to their friends and family or watched other people get divorced, they always have um, some sort of myth about what the divorce is and the laws are and the fears, you know. Um, so I hear it sometimes when they come to my office is like, I'm really afraid because he or she's just going to take my kids and never let me see them or is going to take all my money and do that. So one of the suggestions that I always say is I not having to go to a divorce lawyer and not having to actually sign up for a divorce. Can you ask for one hour of legal consultation only and go share your case and whatever it is as far as, you know, child custody issues of that state, because each state has their own law. So it's like, go just go get information so that you guys are not um, kind of like threatening each other or um, holding each other hostage on information or holding yourself hostage on information that is just not accurate. Because any case, um, any family case, beside the concept of um, emotional aspect, on a financial level or custody level, there's a range that the courts accept. I mean, you, you only work with a range. So with, like, for example, the word you use is like, there's a low uh, low state and there's a high state. And somewhere the truth is, is in the middle where people negotiate. And I usually ask my couples or the person, the individual who's seeing me, who is thinking about divorce is consult one hour um, so that you have an understanding what the range looks like so that you're not freaking yourself out or, or having fantasies, you know, that, because if you're holding a fantasy and it doesn't come through, you're going to be really, really disappointed. But if you have an, you know, a realistic idea about, yes, this is my range. And then yes, how can we do this? So it's a win-win for both of us. Um, and I've seen that really help and some people that actually take that one time and then come back and really get committed actually to work on their relationship what are your suggestions on that i think that's a great idea and so what i tend to do nowadays is i offer a 90 minute consultation because i think in 90 minutes you really can get a little bit of a deeper dive and you can understand somebody's situation and kind of get those first 15 20 minutes of nerves out because a lot of people have never met a lawyer before they're pretty intimidated by the process um, and I think talking to a collaboratively trained attorney is a great first step. And if you're thinking about divorce, you can certainly call me for a counsel because it's it's nationwide. Um, the same things that we talk about, we can then find you lawyers and collaborative attorneys and professionals in your area. I'm happy to help with that. But I think that's a great use of time and energy to get rid of the fantasy, get rid of the myth, get down to reality. I agree with you completely, Fujian. Like the lawyers all know. I we know what the range of reasonableness is. And we can tell you once we know all the basic facts, we can give you that in about, and we could probably get you divorced in like three hours, right? Like two or three hours. We could have one meeting, 
couple lawyers, a couple clients who are ready and emotionally, psychologically ready to be divorced, it will not take six months or a year or two or more to get divorced. Usually those long elongated processes are because somebody is not ready to let go. That's what I usually find, you know, because you could be all the way to the end and all of a sudden you're fighting about something that makes no sense to the lawyers. And we realize, of course, it's never what it appears to be. We're not fighting over the bean pot or whatever, you know, it's the piece of pers personal property. It's not about that. Um, but somebody's not ready to let go. And so when I think in our collaborative model, getting your head around the idea that you can do this in a good way, that you can emerge healthy and not bitter, and that you can have a conversation, even if you're incredibly angry, even if you're incredibly hurt right now, even if you are feeling like your amygdala has been hijacked and you're like in a state of, you know, fight, flight, or freeze, and that is completely common. And you can work through that with the correct support. So I think to your point, getting an hour, getting an hour and a half with an attorney, a collaboratively trained attorney is going to be a different experience than going in for an intake consultation with a divorce lawyer who's going to take you, you know, basically get your basic information and, and file file the complaint, which I find is an aggressive act. Like I prefer to negotiate and settle it all ahead of time and then file it as an uncontested divorce at the end of the day. And that's what we do in a collaborative model. Beautiful. All right, everyone. Untangling Your Marriage, a guide to collaborative divorce by Nancy Smith. Um, another aspect of what you had written in your book that I really enjoyed had to do with uh, saying that people are not ready also with information. So, so we talked about the emotional aspect, but there's also information that is needed that if you're going to be dividing your assets, that people need to have information. And sometimes the thing takes longer and uh, because people have not done their due diligence of bringing the information out. So um, part of what the consultation might, might also help before even you know wanting to go through the process is the idea that somebody says, okay, I'm wanting to separate or I'm wanting to divorce, but I'm going to give it another um, uh, run. I'm going to help, you know, I'm going to give it another six months just to see what happens. And I usually say, go to the consultation so that you know what your needs are as far as information. Yes, we're going to go like, you get your information and see what you need on this end. If you're deciding to go to couples therapy or something, you know, We'll close the doors for six months of conversation about divorce and really go forward. But also, you know, that these are the information that you actually do need to get in order to go, you know, in front of a, an, an attorney and say, here it is. And uh, these are all of our assets. These are the things that are available and then move forward with it. Um, what are some of your suggestions about this area of um, information gathering when people are they're clear that this is what they want to do. So I think it's really important to assess the level of trust and transparency in a relationship. So if you've got a relationship where you, if there's been an affair, for example, so the idea of trust is kind of a, could be a trigger, right? Because you don't, clearly you don't trust your spouse anymore because they were cheating on you and you find out about it and you're upset. Okay, but that's one aspect of life. But does that mean that they're like untrustworthy when it comes to the financial matters like are they not going to give you the information that you might need are they going to be squirrely are they going to take the money and you know put it in an offshore account like are they going to do financial fraud so like you do have to assess like what is your reality and then you need to be honest about it if you've got really imminent concerns about financial um shenanigans and somebody's doing something wrong and and you're really feeling insecure about that then you may not be doing a collaborative case but if you've got basic level of you know what i might be upset with them they're asking for a divorce. However, they're generally an honorable human being and they I feel like they're going to give me the information as soon as I know what to ask for. Then you could do it as a joint effort, frankly. Like it's always very common that somebody in the marriage is less facile with the numbers and the money than somebody else. And so like if you're the one who's been doing it and you're the one who hasn't, like can you sit down together and say, let's take an hour. I'm going to show you everything. I'm going to show you all the passwords. I'm going to write down all the accounts. We're going to have it on one piece of paper, all of our assets, all of our liabilities. We may need to assess how much the house is worth. So how would you like to do that? Would you like to get an appraisal? Would you like to get a market analysis? Should we start with one or both? 
because that's going to be good information. That's going to, you know, it's going to be six to seven to eight weeks to get an appraisal. So if you don't know what your house is worth, like get some objective data, get copies of your most recent uh, 401ks and your uh, in retirement accounts, know what they are, know what they're called, get the proper names of them, figure out what their most recent statements show, put it on the spreadsheet, show your spouse who doesn't really know how to deal with this. This is our budget. This is how much we spend every month. Like this is how much it costs to run this house. This is how much I make. You know, and they, if the other spouse, you know, doesn't know that, like show a couple of pay stubs, you know, oftentimes we'll use like the last four pay stubs, the last two years of tax returns. It could be five years of tax returns. Show your credit card statements, show like what you're spending and like start having that conversation. Sometimes people don't want that. They don't want their spouse to be the one teaching them about their finances. Um, it's uncomfortable. They feel patronized. They don't like it. So that would be a good opportunity to even just have your spouse put that paperwork together the spreadsheet, and then come to a collaborative model where you're going to have, where you will have the opportunity to meet alone with your lawyer and the financial neutral to start to break down your understandings about what, what you need, what you're going to need for your future, what's the long-term impact of, you know, any of these property settlements that we might be coming up with, what's the spousal support need, you know, all of that stuff. Um, so you can either do it together, or if you don't feel comfortable, ask your spouse to put it together on a single sheet. You could take that to your lawyer and say, this is what I think it is. You know, maybe we need, we need, might need to do a little more due diligence and just double check, you know, because we want to trust and verify. It, that's not unreasonable. And, you know, even if you do trust your spouse to give you the good information, the lawyers are going to want to verify it. And that's easy enough, you know, for us to do. So does that, I, I think that that's kind of what I would suggest, like either do it together if you can, or at least have one of you who's got the greater knowledge Put it on a single piece of paper, identify all your assets, all your liabilities, your income, back it up with some basic data, and then I think you're in pretty good shape. And whether you understand it or not is another story, and then you can start to understand it. I think you need to have confidence that eventually you can figure this out. Like if you're the one who hasn't been doing it, that's okay. And in a collaborative model, we're going to recognize that and we're going to want to boost you up and get you the skills and the education so that you feel comfortable and confident managing your own financial security into your future after the divorce. And my assumption is also that um, in the collaborative method, that there's a lot of um, understanding about the the cost custody aspects of what it does to, to children and depending on what their age is. Because again, there's a lot of fear and myth about these custody or wish, you know, fantasies about it that I don't want, uh, you know, I don't want my mate to have, uh, you know, to custody of because I don't know what's going to happen. And it's like, well, you know, you married this person and you chose to have children with them with that gene and genetic issue. And, uh, you know, yes, you, you just, you know, got yourself a good family for the rest of your life. So, um, you, you don't have the control to do that. Like you, you just don't have the option. Mm -hmm. And um, and I've noticed people say, OK, if I don't have the option, then I'll just stay in the marriage because I want to, you know, stay in it until I'm fully in control until, you know, the child is 21 and up. Um, but from a collaborative model, how do you handle the concept of custody issues? So we do it carefully and mindfully and based on not the fears and the anxieties, but what is what's reality and what can people handle? Because historically, just because you've been the historic stay-at-home parent doesn't mean that your other spouse doesn't want to participate more, you know, and now that they're going to be a new, there's going to be a new order of things, and maybe they can take more responsibility. And um, sometimes that's very hard in terms of that identity crisis that we talked about earlier. So we would just kind of have conversations about it. We use tools. We've got, people have different experiences and different values, and now you're going to be separating, and you have family of origin stuff, and you just need to talk about it. Like, what are your different values and how do we even communicate with each other anymore? Um, and what are our priorities for our children? And I find that in the end of the day, most people want their children to feel secure. They want to, their children to feel loved and supported in two homes. They want to try to minimize the disruption in the children's lives. They want the kids to have a roughly comparable standard of living at the end of the day. They want to go to safe schools. Like, they want to maybe go to college or they want to give them a gap year. I mean, like people have some commonality. If you really are at opposite ends of parenting spectrum and you really have 
really fundamentally different philosophies, then that's going to be something that needs to be discussed. And somebody's going to have to be sort of awarded the authority to make those calls. Like if you believe, you know, if you don't believe in certain things, uh, you know, if you want to homeschool versus public school, or you don't believe in vaccines, or you do, like, if you've got that level of conflict, you have to have conversations about it. And we're going to have to work through it. But everyone's going to need to show up at the table and talk about what their concerns are, what their fears are, what, you know, what's the worst that would happen if X, Y, Z. Um, and then also, where do we have commonality? And we try to build on the commonality and try not to focus so much on the differences, which I think tends to, to help. Um, but people have to have a conversation about it. And like, to your point, developmentally, because we have the mental health coach there, they understand child development. Sometimes, depending on the ages of the children, if they've got strong opinions, we might have a child specialist come in and bring the voice of the children in because normally that doesn't happen in a, in a regular case. We might get a guardian ad litem or somebody from the court system who could come in, but that's not the same as having um, the children's needs be front and center in the minds of the couple and of the collaborative team. And if we need you know, input from the actual children, then we would hire somebody else to do that for them. Um, but yeah, we, 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 we talk about it. We talk about all of it. Um, that's what we do in a collaborative model. We, we sit down and we, we discuss our concerns and our interests and fears and uh, how we'd like it to be, like what's the vision for the future. Untangling Your Marriage, A Guide to Collaborative Divorce by Nancy Smith. Um, Nancy, anything we haven't shared that you like us to um, people to know? I just think that people just need to know that collaborative divorce exists as a model. And then when you are thinking about a divorce, there are resources that you can go to that are less um, sort of uh, so intense or aggressive to, to then just go to court and you know file first and talk later. I think finding the collaborative attorneys near you is a reasonable first step. Get Collect information, uh, educate yourselves. And if you end up with friends and family who don't understand the model, um, that's okay, but you should stand strong and advocate for what you truly want. Because if you want a divorce that aligns with your own core values, like integrity, decency, transparency, mutual respect, then you need to advocate for that and you need to find professionals who are gonna support you and your partner on that journey to transform your relationship from what you said is the married couple to a business friendly, you know, co-parenting type of relationship. I see this uh, the mediation similar then to the collaborative or is this two different uh, stages like because for mediation both couple go to the same attorney they have Correct. have two attorneys which might look at the contract at the end but they actually go to one person is this similar to the collaborative attorney or is this different so it's different um i think of collaborative divorce as more like mediation on steroids it's for the couple that needs that additional level of support that they that they need to slow down a little bit, that they've got emotional stuff they still have to work through, that they want to have the support of the financial neutral at the table. Some, but there's a disparity in income or, or power because um, mediation is great for when you go in at an equal level uh, playing field, that you have access to all the information, you feel like you can advocate for yourself, there's not a power differential in the, in the relationship, and you could just go to one neutral person to help you get to an agreement and have a difficult conversation. Um, and then go back to your lawyers and you know negotiate a little bit more traditionally. So the collaborative model has the two lawyers, the mental health coach, and the financial neutral. We're all part of a participation agreement that says that this is how we're expecting each other to behave. Um, if any one of you want to get out of the participation agreement and want to not do collaborative anymore, then the lawyers have to withdraw and the clients end up finding new litigation counsel because um, you know, 98% of cases settle, whether you're doing them in a litigation model or whether you're doing them in a collaborative model. So we want to do good intake at the beginning, make sure that the, the clients are equipped emotionally, um, psychically, spiritually, psychologically, ready to um, come to the table in good faith and negotiate. And so we don't want to set up a, a collaborative case to fail. Um, the types that people that may not be well suited to the collaborative model have uh, serious personality disorders that that are not managed. And those folks would end up being more likely to be in a contested litigation case anyways, you know, because they're just really difficult and 
don't want to negotiate, you know, or can't, you know, they just can't, um, given and their is, personality. And then say, is the team already set up or can, is the team developed? So for example, if somebody has their financial um, advisor or if somebody have their own therapist, do they come in and, and create a, a participation agreement within what is available? Or when they come, for example, to you, you already have your team of attorneys and mental health coach and financial coaches that you know you bring with you. Right. So every state ha- that practices, we all practice collaborative divorce. In every state, there are practice groups that are professional alliances where there's mental health professionals, lawyers, and uh, financial neutrals who work together. And so somebody would come to me as their lawyer, their collaborative lawyer, their spouse would find a collaborative lawyer, and then we would put the team together. So because you don't want to have ongoing relationships and conflicts of interest after the fact. So the collaborative team, like the financial neutral, is there to facilitate the conversation and the resolution. They're not there to provide financial planning advice down the road or or sell you products. Um, same thing with the mental health coach. We want you all to have your own finan- your own mental health professionals on the side. And that could also be your um, your co-parenting coach or whatever. We love that. Like the more therapists are involved, the better, because then that means really people are doing the work. They're going to have resources that they're going to need to be able to fall back on when things get tough, because things always get tough. Even in a collaborative model, you know, it's not all, you know, rainbows and unicorns. There are tough moments and we want to be able to have the wherewithal to, to get through them. So the mental health coach is not pro- providing therapy. They're not diagnosing you. They're not doing any of that. They're there to manage the intense emotions. They're there to normalize all that. They're there to facilitate conversations about child development, uh, parenting plans, building uh, trust and communication, like basic skills to get you through the collaborative process. So that's a great question, but we like the, the team members are specific are specifically trained in collaborative practice. And the adjuncts, we love them uh, because they're there to be providing support to the clients offline. So we don't have those awful conversations where we're spending an hour talking about what your mother did, you know, 20 years ago. Right. Well, everyone, please go get the book, Untangling Your Marriage, A Guide to Collaborative Divorce. Um, Nancy, it was such a great pleasure to have you. Uh, Learned a lot from you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And for all of you who are out there, create an amazing life for yourself and everyone around you. And until next week, bye-bye.